Well, let's now go back to Majid Nawaz. He is chairman of the Quilliam Foundation for us. He is in our central London studio. And uh, Majid, we were discussing earlier the fact that uh, this is taking place, these three attacks, during Ramadan. Now, for many of us, we associate Ramadan with a time of, of reflection, of sacrifice, of peace and of prayer. Why are these attacks happening? There are two reasons why ISIS is keen to attack in Ramadan. One is clear uh, and obvious, in fact, it's that they established their so-called caliphate last Ramadan and uh, Caliph Baghdadi was declared to the world in the month of Ramadan as the so-called leader of Muslims across the world. So they want to mark their anniversary. But the second is interesting. Um, jihadists for a long time haven't seen the month of Ramadan as a month of fasting, as a month of abstention, as a month of reflection and prayer. Instead, they've interpreted it to be a month of war, a month of jihad. And uh, they look back to certain tradition within the medieval period of Islam and its early days, um, all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad, in fact. And they, and they, and they draw out tradition uh, where there were certain battles that took place in the month of Ramadan, famous battles and great victories in history. And they in seek inspiration from these because they believe they are resurrecting and replicating the founding principles of Islam all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad himself. So they seek to imitate those uh, battle victories in the month of Ramadan. And it's no surprise, therefore, that their spokesperson, Muhammad al-Adnani, their ideologue, has been promising over social media for a long time uh, that there will be multiple attacks uh, in this month to mark uh, both the anniversary of ISIS's uh, uh, declaration of the caliphate and, and to mark the month itself. And in your opinion, is that a, a perversion of the reading of what Ramadan should be about? Yes, it's very important for us to understand that there are two extremes in this debate. There are those um, who are trying to be polite, um, and usually the left and the liberal commentate, commentariat, who insist that these attacks have nothing to do with Islam. And then there are those who are uh, usually anti-Muslim uh, bigots, uh, who say they have everything to do with Islam. And, and, and then, of course, those in the middle who want to be careful succumb to what I call the Voldemort effect, which is, you know, he who must not be named, and we cannot name the true, true problem. I think the answer here is that, that these attacks have something to do with Islam. They also have something to do with foreign policy. They have something to do with identity and grievances and underemployment. But what we cannot deny is that they also have something to do with the religion of Islam, my religion uh, itself. And I call that something the ideology of Islamism which seeks justification and inspiration from an interpretation of my religion. And the importance in recognizing that is that because Muslims, Imams, uh, common everyday Muslims, along with everyone else in civil society, as we did with racism in this country, as we did with homophobia, we all have a role to isolate, identify and challenge this Islamist ideology. And that's a generational struggle that lies ahead of us. And if you were to be, uh, I mean, just the problem, when you put it like that, it sounds almost too hard to tackle. If you were advising uh, governments, uh, I mean, where do you start? Yes, I can hear the <laughs> exasperation in your voice, and, and it's unfortunate. We are very, very far behind on, online with this debate. Uh, we're playing whack-a-mole with ISIS accounts online on social media, and we're incredibly far behind on the grassroots. It's very rare these days to hear a religious preacher in the mosques debunk the very notion of resurrecting a caliphate. Not disagreeing with ISIS. I don't deserve a pat on the back for disagreeing with the worst terrorist group history has ever known. That still puts me in the same camp as Al-Qaeda, the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist groups who also disagree with ISIS. What we need is to take the debate to the ideas and you know I think the government could make a good start by uh, announcing a strategy that is long overdue from the communities and local government department to work with communities to start challenging some of the ideological underpinnings, the Islamist ideology itself, and bolstering voices within communities to start pushing back against some of this. Now, we don't know yet uh, the identities of the uh, gunmen involved in all three. We know some of the identities, but not all of them yet. Is it too much of a stretch to make the link to uh, return fighters and, and what to do with those men when they come back? Because uh, Tunisia has one of the largest uh, number of uh, people in uh, Syria and Iraq, and, and as does France for Europe. I have three, I have three uh, worries with France, and I have a worry with Tunisia. The three con France is we need an answer as to whether this is a homegrown terrorist, whether it's a returning fighter, or it's a delivery on ISIS promise that they will use the people smuggling routes to mingle their fighters in with genuine asylum seekers who also, by the way, desperately need our help because they're fleeing ISIS. Um, and ISIS has assured us that they will be smuggling fighters in with these genuine asylum seekers to infiltrate Europe. And that's the third area. So if the French attack could be any one of these three. We don't know yet. The concern I have with 
Tunisia is like France. Tunisia has, I mean, more so than France, Tunisia has the highest number of foreign fighters that have gone to join ISIS, as you mentioned, up to 3,000. But in Europe, France has the highest number. So there's, there's a silver lining to this horrific attack, and that's that ISIS have, in fact, by choosing France and Tunisia, if they indeed did so, chosen targets that are easy for them because they have an abundance of fighters coming from these two countries. And that tells us ISIS is on the defensive. It tells us that, that, tells us that they're seeking spectacular attacks to try and make themselves relevant because they are facing certain setbacks on the battlefield in Iraq and Syria. But it also does raise alarm bells because, of course, France is just across the channel and we are unfortunately overdue an attack here in the United Kingdom as well. I'm very worried about the destabilization of Libya, which could be the next Syria, because the largest contingent of ISIS fighters who control territory in Libya happen to also be Tunisians.